Welcome to The Wizard and the Priestess. My name is Nula and this is my co-host. Matt. Welcome to today's episode. Today we're going to be diving in to the topic that is... Are you talking a lot of... I don't know, it just started okay. coming. Sorry, as you were. I was just channeling. Is, it, is, it <laughs> is this a bad time for you? <laughs> it's a great time, Matt. I'm so excited. Today we are diving deeply into the idea of sabotage. Self-sabotage. What's happened in the last minute? <laughs> Did I miss out on something? <laughs> I want some. <laughs> there's, there's nothing. It's just inside of me. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's Esmeralda or Luigi. We have different names at home. Okay. <laughs> the kids love Luigi when, they, when he does their hair. Exactly. <clears throat> so we're talking about self-sabotage. Are we born with it, Matt? No and yes. What we are mean? not because it's generally learnt. With that said, it is often generational. So technically you could argue yes at the same time. One could say it's its own paradox. Fantastic. Yeah. Like life itself. It's often learnt. It's often from at one point our mother or father would have said you don't deserve to be happy, to be rich, to be beautiful, healthy, whatever it is. And the younger you were when you went through that, the deeper it imprints into the psyche. So the more and more unconscious it becomes. Just the one time? No. Like it, it's like a... The pattern. Well, it's the pattern, but it can only happen one time. It could have just impacted you that much. Yeah. Where it just became part of your blueprint and then it's in your DNA. That's when you pass it on to generations. Yeah, fully. Do you want to talk through that? (laughs) So I drew a really cool picture, everyone, and it's a bit confusing. But I guess my my take on self-sabotage with the, you know, A bit of an eclectic mix of different realms but like bringing in the five elements and bringing in the idea of how how sabotage comes from or where it comes from in the beginning. What is it in TCM? Well, it can be something specific like as in self-sabotage could look like, um, well, like we would have discussed, it could be part of the wood element, it could be correlated to the gallbladder which is the kind of our decision-making or our... We could call the the gallbladder is the PA to the liver. The liver being like the father figure, the the promoter, the goer, the getting the chi flow, like mm-hmm. getting everything going, setting those boundaries, maintaining them t- to the best of the ability. However, from that, so it could kind of sit in that gallbladder where the people please our aspect and like so we just let go of part of ourselves and we don't follow on our soul path specifically to dumb ourselves down or dull ourselves down, yep. with, whether we are not aware of it or not. Mm. Now, we could kind of sit it there. We could sit it in actually quite a few of the diff- other elements as well um, because it could be, um, you know, we sabotage how, how self-sabotage itself sits. However, the way I want to kind of bring it is that it can be in any of the elements. And the way that I was describing it before is that realistically we, when we have this element of sabotage, it's this part of us or piece of us as a human that we wants to be in control still. Mm -hmm. And so in order for us to actually lean in and move through and become aware of that, those pieces, like or come out of it and to actually look down and go, oh, yeah, wow, that is something that I'm doing that's actually working against me, Mm -hmm. um, we need to let go of control and move through our comfort zone and come out the other side. Yeah. Now, when I was saying this to Matt, I was describing it as a necklace, maybe because I'm wearing a necklace today, and then imagining that you have like... Do you want me to put it up? No, 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 they don't need to see 
but let's just say we have beads upon our necklace or different crystals upon our necklace and each of those crystals stand for a piece of trauma or something that we've experienced in our lives. Yeah. And then every time we are reactivated in that, so for example, say we were unseen by our parents and then we're trying to show someone something and they're not seeing us yeah. and that just triggers that response inside of us that either that makes us want to say for example we have an avoidant strategy and we choose to avoid so that avoidance comes probably closely interlinked to something like um, just trying to think of say an element specifically we could probably say that when we start to avoid things it's probably a bit of a fire element and it could be related to that avoidance of connection so we avoid we we separate um, we become completely like don't want to be with anyone, want to yeah. be alone, complete loner. And that's our way of that piece, that bead, that's yeah. our that's our way of maintaining that bead on our necklace and that's our, and we will keep that for the rest of our lives. So that's our way of maintaining ourself. Yes. Yep. So we keep doing that because we want that bead to be on the necklace without yeah. us knowing. It's an yeah. unconscious. Yeah, yeah action and so what I was trying to describe was each of those beads has and I think I've shared this before but each of those beads essentially has its own security guard that every time we are triggered or activated in that way because of what we've had previously because our parents didn't see us or that specific piece our parent didn't see us in a certain way we then have this dysfunction in the fire element which makes us act this way Mm -hmm. And then slowly we might, so then we start to sabotage anything that goes that way. So say, for example, we have an opportunity to do some collaborative work, but because we're afraid of not being seen, we won't even do the collaborative work or we'll start doing the collaborative work and we'll find problems with it. Yeah, you'll just completely avoid it. Avoid it and go in and be like, no, I actually can only work on my own. It actually, like working together doesn't work for me. And there was this huge, beautiful opportunity that, from my from my perspective, the universe was throwing at you, trying to get you to initiate and go deep into and giving you this beautiful opportunity. But in your mind, you weren't ready, you weren't capable, and that is part of the self-sabotage act. It's mm-hmm. like and and then if you're not actually aware that you're self-sabotaging, you'll keep doing it as a as a means to maintain that pearl on your neck or that that particular thing because you like the way those that necklace sits. You like the look of it from a more conscious level mm. and if you're not aware of what's going on uncon- like un- Well, you wouldn't know that you can change it anyway. Yeah, and you have no idea that yeah. you actually have the power to yeah. completely rewire. Hence, like you did mention before, like this, you know, it may be passed on but this is that whole thing about being the field breaker or being the like, you know, the breaker of the necklace or... That's not really said, but I'm, you know, mm. like getting the new necklace, that's a really hard thing to that's do. That's called healing. But it is. That's yeah. called healing and that's called, you know, being the change maker that actually adjusts how we move forward and so you don't continue to pass on yeah. the same necklace down generation, generation, generation. You you go, you know what, we don't need that anymore. We can we can get a new, we can get something different. Yeah. Go to a different um, shop. Yeah. So I think like. I could go deep, could go more into what the different self sabotage pieces are, but I think you could probably go into our five element, um, five element series on like what mm. the different emotions are in each and every one, and you could kind of nut out what pieces might be coming up for you and how you might be sabotaging yourself. So, is there a different sabotage for water to wood to fire? Yeah, so you've got the you've got the yang and the yin of each of the elements like we've spoken yeah. about previously. So if you've got say for example the liver's an easy one. One sec. Look, it's just to her baby. So would you say the the yin and the yang is is that almost correlative correlative to too much too little? Not quite. Um it's probably more like action in action. Right. Than it is too much, too little. And then I would say that, say, for example, with the wood element, we've got the liver and the gallbladder. The liver would be sitting. So they both sort of sit in the emotion of compassion, the functionality of maintaining our boundary Mm -hmm. and protection. But the way that they would show show up would be differently. It would be excess or deficient. 
So yeah. if there was a liver relationship, we'd look more at an excess mm-hmm. and you could see something. I mean, you could have a deficiency in the liver too. But um, the way we'd treat it yin-yang-wise would be like if we're going to treat the yin organ and we're going to treat the yang organ or the yang organ. And so, for example, with the liver, you would see signs and symptoms of that sort of sabotage happening where you are OCD. So if you are in excess, you have so much wood that is growing unconditioned, like un, you know, unbound. Yeah. It's almost like you've created such a thick boundary yeah. that no one can actually penetrate through that. So you just keep building more fences and more like armour. Mm. Um, and then the way that you maintain or like, you know, you have to check, recheck, double check. And, you know, someone's like, oh, you, I need you. To, I need that done now, otherwise I'm not going to get this done and you won't have it done because you need to recheck, check again, check again, mm. perfectionism type stuff. Um, and then you've got the gallbladder, which would be they're going to put someone else's needs ahead of their own. And that's sort of um, that kind of, yeah, where they don't have enough, they don't have enough wood. Mm. They've just got, they've you know, they've put a stick up in front of their house in the hope that that keeps the wolves out. Mm. And um, and they're willing to just bend for whoever. Mm. They don't actually have the sticks are like so malleable. They don't mm. have a firm grasp. There's no deep root. Waterlogged. Likely. Boom. So yeah, that would be how um, I would kind of see that in terms of a particular like sabotage. But yeah, each element would be that way. Each sure. yin and yang would be that way. You could go through and the way that I was describing this to Matt is is, is imagine you've got like this necklace of trauma that you keep wearing and adorning adoring every day and you love it and you, you know, you continue to wear it out of like, oh, yeah, this looks good, mm. it looks good on me. But then slowly you start to look and peel back the layers and look at that and go, hang on a minute, what is in this necklace? Like what is this about? How is this impacting me? And then as you take one of those beads off the necklace and you look at it, you could start to say, okay, wow, I actually have this deep-seated fear, Mm. Um, this fear of being, say, I might have a fear of being alone, which might be, it actually incorporates the water, fire, dyad, like the double, um, which is normal. You probably, it's not that common to have a bead or a um, trauma or an impact that's just on the one Mm element but it's like yes so it's like understanding okay I've got the fear here I now so where do I like am I stuck there am I in like this deficient stuckness where the deficient stuckness is like a phobia and I just hold on to it and I just can't like I can't actually move through or am I in this like actually no that would be more an excess stuckness which is when you have a phobia and fear and then the deficient deficiency there would be more like like you actually don't know what danger is. Mm. We've spoken of that before mm. where you get yourself in really, really prickly situations all the time. You're like, I don't know why I got here again. Mm. Like he almost stabbed me. Like how did I end up in a dark alley and... We don't need to know about your weekend. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> anyway, so yeah. Yeah, so I mean how many people do you know have been in that situation of life but it just keeps happening magically? That is the thing. Yeah. They still have that bead on that necklace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not looking at it. They do. From a psychological viewpoint, it, it's quite archetypal. So the archetypes would speak to us instinctually. So they go through the instinctual system. So the instinct that you have to react or to respond to any person, place or thing is heavily influenced by the archetypal is it the archetypal point that you're at on your life's journey? Kind of. So if you think about you have an out, so I'll go backwards. If you have an outcome, that's determined by a behaviour. The behaviour is essentially set up by a belief. Belief is a thought we keep thinking. The mechanism, if you want to call it that, that drives the thought is the archetype. Okay, which, and could we see that as a trauma piece? No, no, so no, not necessarily. Not necessarily, but each archetype chooses us as its own experience. So we are, if we all come from a single point of consciousness, consciousness itself needs to get to know itself because consciousness itself can't know itself without polarity. 
So the polarity it chooses is the archetype. The archetype plays itself out through us. So then does that mean that we actually don't heal the generational trauma if there's the part of the soul, soul that's like, I've chosen this archetype to live and play out We over come here to again. heal or learn how to heal. That particular archetype. Well, that archetype or that particular trauma, but that trauma might include the victim, it might include the saboteur, it might include the child. It's not it just could, the one. It's never, well... I can't say it's never just the one, but it's often several. But think of all the stuff that you've healed and what archetypal dances were going on mm. at that time. Mm. So if you think the first archetype is Imago Dei, which is image of deity or what your beliefs about God or where we come from, mm-hmm. that's the first archetype. From there we go through the mother and father or the yin and the yang the Adam and the Eve, however you want to say that. And we all had a mother. We all had a father. So to the degree that those, if there's an issue, unresolved issue with mother or father, then how you view your father, you actually, that neurologically wires you to view males in this lifetime, that relationship. So to the degree you have unresolved issues there, that's going to be looking through the lens of how you view reality in relation to a male. Same with mum. So let's say you were never t- you were told at some point, whether they were joking or not, because remember by the age, until the age of seven, we're in the theta brainwave, so we're in a hypnotic, all but hypnotic state, so we're in full-on absorption mode. And you were told that you weren't going to be good enough. You don't deserve to be good enough. You're not pretty. You're going to be fat. Whatever the thing was, you're going to wear that. And it's not like if someone told you that today, you just tell them to piss off. You're going to like wear it with every cell of your being. So the next time that comes up in a real life adult situation, that's the point in which you get triggered. So if you think of your chronological life, keep, that keeps moving, but your psychological influences, that stops developing, that stops growing at the age of the first trauma, which usually happens before age seven, seven to ten, but let's say seven, let's go five. <laughs> so, for example, when I lost my mum at three and a half, that set up a psychological polarity within me that for many years, unconsciously, if a woman came into my life, I would view that she's always just going to leave. So I had to go back and heal all that to sort that shit out. And you see them all out the front now. (laughs) (laughs) Lining up, ladies, lining up. We're having a real trouble, just like a side note on that. We're having big trouble with Wizard Wants a Wife because there's just... It's fine. It's just been too many and it's um, it's been a bit overwhelming. I haven't had the time and... (laughs) Space and neither has Matt, so we will be getting back to you, yeah, ladies. That's exactly what's happened. <laughs> Was that a snort? I was just trying to breathe. <laughs> <sighs> Gotta breathe. Yeah, so maybe there's a bit of work to still to be done. Oh, maybe I've done too good a job. <laughs> Oh. Or at least when she comes, mate, she's not going to leave. That's so. it. Oh, dear. Um, oh, I'm glad, so, I, yeah, that's... glad I chose that analogy. Um. <laughs> Don't try <drown him. laughs> um. <coughs> So the mother and father archetypes are our core archetypes. So we go one, or, one way or the other. We'll have some sort of trauma either way? Well, probably sometimes both. I mean... But I'm saying times? that's our... <laughs> That's our concrete slab for our psychological wiring. Oh, yeah. Our parents really know how to push our buttons because they're the ones that build them. This so says CG Jung. Wow, CG, you are. He's onto it. <laughs> so then we have our survival archetypes. Some people call the child survival, some people call them core archetypes. But if you think 
we all had a mother and father and we were all all a child. So the child needs nourishment, the child needs attention, the child needs love. And if it didn't get that, it shows up in later adult life as potentially saboteur, victim, prostitute. It can be someone who seeks independence but to the degree that they don't want help from anyone else and actually push it away because they're so independent. So these are people that psychologically never grow up. So if you think 90% of the world's population don't graduate past who they were psychologically at age of 12, then all of a sudden your relationships make sense. And it means that 90% of the world's population psychologically, if someone tells them what to do, they'll just do it. And if someone tells them that they won't be good enough, then that's what they, they wear. And they believe that with every fibre of their being. Or they'll be victim or they'll be uh, the, the prostitute archetype which sells their, sells them, you know, sells their soul for money or material. Is the prostitute archetype, could we call it, correlate them to, I'm sure someone's done this with the five elements, they probably correlate, oh, it's probably a mix actually when I think about it right now. Mix? Oh, of elements, like where that, yeah. where that. I've got so Carolyn Mrs. Archetype cards. There's the prostitute. Mm-hmm. So each archetype has the light and shadow. The light is the, you could correlate that to the positive. The shadow is really the unconscious aspect that we don't really want to acknowledge. Mm. So a mother, for example, the light attribute is the nurturing the patient, the unconditional love has just pure joy in giving life where the shadow is the smothering or abandoning the child or instilling guilt when the child becomes independent of mother. So that's the light and shadow. We all have a choice to be light or shadow. Those core archetypes set us up foundationally for life and the reason I brought that up is because when we go through a stressful event, that becomes our default setting within the psyche. The archetype, light. The, the shadow, the shadow aspect. aspect of that archetype. Yeah. So if you have an argument with someone, they're going to perceive and project through the mother, through the father, the child, whoever. Which brings us on to the saboteur because the saboteur is all about undermining themselves. Mm. So it's typical of one of those people where self-empowerment isn't quite on the top of their list and it a really common one I worked with actually last week was someone who... Hey, Kerry. <laughs> who? I'm joking. Someone who finally found the ideal relationship. Mm-hmm. She found him and it was all fine. And I think they were together for about eight months and then she just had to put a spanner in the works and fuck it up. But she did it consciously. It's like, no, I don't, this is too good to be true, so I've got to ruin it. That's classic. Did she fully sabotage. ruin it? Yeah, what? like it, yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no, no going, going back. back. No. I highly doubt it. We're trying, but I'm not hopeful. He's not returning my calls. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kerry. We tried. So that's an example. Or if you're trying to lose weight and you're... Losing the weight, but then oh, I'll just have a cookie. I'll just have that cake. And then it's another piece. And then it's another piece. It's These really, are yeah, classic. I guess, yeah. Gosh, that's so hard though. I think I find like maybe because I've, I, haven't, I haven't particularly ever had a weight issue as such, but like if I had to just really hone in and do something That'd be really, really hard to just, I would always, I always, I would sell myself. I'd be like, it's fine. Moderation. Like. There's moderation and there's moderation. (laughs) (laughs) There's a fun moderation and then there's a moderation that, well, my desire is, my desire to lose weight is stronger than my desire to have that piece of cake. Yeah, right. In this analogy. Do you reckon that, okay. Sorry. Go on, no. 
I just wonder, like, Delicious with that food. one piece of cake, like, I often speak it as soul foods with my kids now. Like, I use the term soul food. They're absolutely good for the soul and they, they really nourish the soul. So we just have them every now and then because the soul doesn't need a lot to eat because it's just well, it's a vibrant. But Quite a different context, isn't it? Yeah, potentially. But I just feel like, do you reckon that would be it? Like, unless you are focused, so focused, so heavily focused, I mean... I'm sure that all the studies have been done to show that, yeah, if you don't have the calorie intake, maybe you will lose the weight. But I don't know. Part of me, is, like, wants to say that just have the cake. I roll. <laughs> so <laughs> Nula's advocating if you want to lose weight, go for the cake. <laughs> I'm saying that you put that microphone down. <laughs> Aqua's looking at me like, yeah, he's right. Just the one piece of cake, one time. Did you want to go outside? <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. You tell me. So we're talking self-sabotage. It yeah. was an example. Okay. Sorry. So if you have the, the willingness to have the cake and celebrate it and hold it as a celebration, so I've done really well so far. Let's say I'm halfway to my goal. I can have a bit of cake to celebrate. But then tomorrow I'm back into it hardcore. Not harder than you were already, just the same as I was. Sure. Cool, I'm good. Why are you sabotaging me? (laughs) (laughs) I just want to know what level the saboteur sits because I have like... It sits at the deepest level. It is probably, from what I've worked with, apart from mother, father and arguably Amargo, it's probably the strongest, most powerful archetype. In terms of sabotage? In terms of people going through a crisis. What's the light stuff of saboteur? Well, it it highlights your fear of self-empowerment and the changes it would bring. That doesn't sound good. That's the light. Yeah, but that doesn't sound good. Well, it's bringing you into conscious awareness that you're going for the cake but you're consciously, oh, I shouldn't have this right now because it's going to take me away from my goal. But I eat it anyway? That's the shadow. Uh Uh-huh. The the shadow is you doing that unconsciously. Right, so the saboteur is actually bringing to light the pieces, the piece of cake. Oh, (laughs) boom. Nula in the house. (laughs) Wow. Um... I don't know where I was going with that anymore. Anyway, um, okay, so saboteur is another. So this could be the reason we came here. Absolutely. Okay, what's next? Well, what's next is do you know people who do really well at something and they just screw it up? Give me an example of someone like that. Someone who is really good at something. Don't say the same thing slower. (laughs) Those. They've, they've found a... Um, so who's someone? Like, don't even tell me their name. <laughs> but tell me, the, describe someone for me. Let's say their soul gets called to do something mm-hmm. and they feel good doing it, but then they choose something else because let's say it... Provides more money or... Yeah. Okay. So that's like a self-sabotage. But that's also a prostitute archetype. You could almost say archetypal possession. Exactly. So an archetypal possession is essentially where you act these out unconsciously. Mm -hmm. So you're walking along, then next minute, boom. (laughs) So I had a client years ago who he had diagnosed, I think it's pancreatitis or something like that. And it turns out when we traced it back, it took us a while to get there because he was so unconscious of it. We had to peel back the layers. And he wanted to own a... um, He wanted to do like a conservation thing with animals and nature or something. But it would have cost a fortune to set it up. He didn't have the money. Long story short... And he wouldn't have made him any money. No. Once he had a conservatory. But then, long story short he ended up working for an oil company. (laughs) So he kind of went the other way. But he's making really good money. But he felt this thorn in his side the whole time. And he never felt comfortable in his job. He never enjoyed it at the 
at that soul level. It wasn't a labour of love. It was purely he was prostituting himself. So he went against his own soul calling for that and actually made him sick because he had a great diet, exercise, all that kind of stuff. But because he went against his own will, mm-hmm. I don't know where I was going with that. You were describing a person, a saboteur? Saboteur, yeah. Okay. So it's these... Anytime you're inducing a self-destructive behaviour or the desire to undermine others, so you might want to step on other people's heads climbing the corporate ladder. Is that the expression? Stepping on heads? Shoulders. Um, Stab people in the back climbing the corporate ladder. Climbing the ladder? You know what I mean. Just climbing up there. Climbing up the ladder. Using someone else to get up. That. I know. I I mean, I'm, I'm explaining the visual. Yes, good. Good. So that's sabotaging someone else. Mm-hmm. But that really goes against a lot of human nature. Mm. So in a way, whatever we do to the self, we do to the... Sorry, whatever we do to the other, we do to the self. Mm. So it's like a punishment to self by punishing others around us. Kind of, yeah. I know many people who have sabotaged themselves in this life by punishing themselves because they believe at the most, the deepest unconscious level that they, if they punish themselves, God doesn't have to when they die. Okay. True story. What's the next one, Matt? The next saboteur. No, the next... Uh Aha, okay. Are you going to go through all of them? No, no, I don't want to go through all of them unless you want to, but I was just thinking, okay... So the saboteur is essentially um, the people that have the most self-sabotage or what? (laughs) (laughs) This episode about them? (laughs) The the sabotage scale, is that what we're talking? Maybe. Is the people with the sabotage the people with the most sabotage? (laughs) The saboteur. Yeah, the saboteur archetype. Archetype. Yes. They're the person that we're doing this episode for, right? Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Cool. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> Does everyone have a little bit of the saboteur? We all have everything. We're all going to be tested. At some point, we all get tested in these survival archetypes, which are the child, the saboteur, the victim and the prostitute, and we all get um, tested at some point in our lives. I'm just putting the cards out. Now, we all have issues to some degree with our parents. All good silence. (laughs) We were all a child, so with the child, the orphan, the magical, the wounded, the eternal, etc. We all have aspects of these archetypes within us. They all play out differently. So my my victim will be different to your victim mm. and how you play victim. Yeah. So we would sabotage ourselves differently. Yeah, okay. So what is one way you've sabotaged that you're consciously aware of? I'm sure there's many ways that I'm sabotaging myself. I just can't. Um, can I phone a friend? I'm sure they'll be able oh. to tell me. <laughs> tell us how you we'll have get, uh, so that I can think mind. more. <laughs> um, so I think it was my, how old was I? I want to say 10. I remember... I had a deep, um, I was told that if I didn't do something, I didn't deserve to have, I think it was a bike. Mm. So one of my parents said, if you do this chore really well, we'll get you a bike. And I I remember consciously fucking it up because I didn't think I deserved the bike. I would actually feel guilty getting the bike. Oh. I know. Yeah. So that's an example of how the saboteur can come say hi. 
Yeah, right. I feel like of all the like <laughs> terrible as dark as shadow attributes that I have like played out, saboteur is not one that comes to mind easily. Yeah, I don't identify too much as a saboteur in like later life. Yeah, right. But a lot of patients do have that. Yeah, Because right. the ultimate, the concrete slab of the saboteur itself is low self-esteem. Yeah. You know what, and I think about that aspect, I can think of it in terms of, um, you know, even just stepping in as, you know, this what we've kind of, I mean, for you personally, you probably really, um, you live and breathe wizardry whether or not you like it or whether or mm. not you think so. And for me personally, I have spent probably the recent five year, four or five years really stepping into who I am and and in re- more, even recent times as much as the last year I've really felt myself like, yeah, I actually feel like I like who I am as I am, how I'm practising life, how I'm playing. It all feels really good. It feels like I'm really owning and loving that. Mm. But even in that, like stepping into this space of the priestess at times I can feel myself you know, second guessing that this is, you know, and being like, oh, yeah, I'm not actually good enough to be that or I'm not mm. actually in that space. So Imposter I'll, syndrome. Yeah, in a sense or um, somewhat pulling myself out of that and going, yeah, well, not quite more. Not quite imposter syndrome, oh, maybe potentially, right? Like I don't actually, I can't really put it, articulate it very clearly, but it's almost like. I think everyone feels imposter syndrome at some point, mm. doing something. Yeah, and I think mine was probably more that like I would see, I would see, you know, there was like clinicians that had mm. had quarter the amount of experience that I had and I was like, what? how did you guys have enough confidence to just dive mm. into that and just go? It's like PTs. Most it's either the personal trainer that knows a lot and is really good at what they do, but they can't sell themselves. Yeah. Or the guy that, or the girl, the PT, that doesn't know that much, and they go to YouTube University, and they're really good at selling themselves. Yeah. And they 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 nail it. Yeah. 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 That's there's something in that I mm. think the saboteur aspect. I mean, there might be just more the victim or probably more a victim aspect I would say that I'd sit more in like, oh, poor me, I've done all this work and I'm not getting out of what... Yeah, I mean, they all hold hands, right? Yeah. It's all part of the same pyramid. Yeah. Um, Okay, so more into this self-sabotage, like where can we go from here now that we kind of understand that we're all wearing this necklace of beads of trauma and somewhat sabotaging ourselves or the way that I was leaning more into was the the patterns in general, mm. like if we have picked up some form of um, trauma gem, as I'm going to call it today, and we're wearing that, adorning that on our necklace, um, how do we go about like moving that through? Like how do we go about getting that off the necklace or like clearing that from our act to um, our, our consciousness or our, you know, changing that vibrations and that frequency so that we no longer have that coil or that trauma within us. What do we do? Hear me out. Magic. What? The real de- <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> the real definition of magic is using the unconscious consciously. Okay. So the first thing we have to do is become aware of what we're doing. Even if we don't stop the behaviour, the self-sabotaging behaviour, the the real trick is to catch yourself doing it. So if you're going for the cake, be it literal or metaphorical, love cake, then even if you keep eating the cake, I tell patients to just say out loud, I'm about to eat the cake. And then eventually I'm about to go, this is going to take me further away from my goal. Mm-hmm. You're making the unconscious conscious because a lot of people will eat the cake and then next minute it's gone and they don't remember eating the cake. Yeah. What? <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> Perfectly I could, can't believe it. Magic. Spilled her drink. <laughs> She's Make, in shock. She, 
Macy's in shop. <laughs> what do you mean Those... they didn't know they ate the cake? They just ate the cake. The cake was there. The cake is gone. I now have chocolate on my lip. How did you not know? <laughs> There's so many directions. <laughs> that live brain just took me. Wow. Let's bring it back. Keep on track. Back Keep on track. Okay, so where's the cake? The okay. cake. It's eaten. Hey. It's been eaten. The cake's been eaten. You can still keep eating the cake as long as you're consciously aware that you're moving further eating away the cake. from your goal. Yes. If your goal was, and then to you lose say, it. "I'm eating the cake," and that's taking me further away from my goal. At some point, that mental muscle gets flicked. Oh, I'm going away from my goal now. I'm consciously going away from my goal. I might just put the cake down or have less cake. Nula loves cake, apparently, so we have to have less of it now. Disappointing. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so that's our first step, is verbalising our, oh, like, our unconsciousness. Oh, no, well, first of all, we have to become aware yes. <laughs> that the cake didn't just magically disappear. It's not. We ate it. Mm-hmm. And then once we're aware that we are going to do that potentially again. Well, then... You want to get to a space where you can sit with it, not the cake, the idea of the cake, (laughs) and get to that point of what is it about this that I cannot maintain myself? And it's even, I'd arguably say it's worse, it's not worse, could be worse, it's more interesting in a group dynamic. Have you ever noticed in a group of people that there's this, unspoken rule that it's okay to pick a member of the tribe up but a member of the tribe cannot elevate themselves beyond the level of the tribe itself. The tribe doesn't like someone moving faster than someone else with everyone else within the tribe unless the tribe's going with them. uh, So like someone being cocky? Could be, yeah. What's another example? Well, if you're in a group of people and Never you're... Never want to eat cake. I had a feeling, you know what, I had a feeling that the cake would be a bad analogy. And nothing else came to me, so I went with it. I backed myself. <laughs> I'm just imagining the tribe and the cake. I kind of want cake now. <laughs> but what's the thing? <laughs> what's well, the I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Generally in a group of people. Right. Yeah. Now your group probably wouldn't resonate with this. We might. That much, maybe. But generally speaking, a group of people, right, X amount of people, okay, 10 people, because yeah. I know you like your details. <laughs> that group of friends or co-workers or colleagues, whatever it is, they will happily pick someone up if someone's dropped, not literally dropped. Oh, okay. So they, we're going to help them. They like they can. They're happy to help, but when that person all wants of a sudden gets faster, faster, more evolved, whatever you want to call it, the group as a collective don't usually like that. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm Getting trying to, to say. Oh, I thought you were going to. You were trying to say. What? <laughs> Should I even try this? Go on. I thought you were trying to say, like, if there's someone. <laughs> Imagine if we had a radio show. <laughs> I was thinking that you were going to say something along the lines of um, when when a group of people are together and there's, like, someone who is trying not to eat cake. <laughs> like, <laughs> like someone. Someone who doesn't want to lose, like someone who's trying to lose weight. And the tribe is more doesn't likely. Make, doesn't make any sense. The tribe is more likely to tell them, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, are they? Are they more likely? I think that that would be more awkward to tell someone who's trying to lose weight. Might be a little bit, you know, they're obviously trying to lose weight. And you're like, nope, not you. The whole group collect is like, no cake to you. <laughs> We're going to hold. And I'm like, that actually is not what happens. But You're right. No one says that. And no. then I thought you were going to say that in the opposite form, that we're more likely to say joke to the person who doesn't, 
like you, for example, that doesn't really eat cake, be like, oh, you don't have the cake, like, ha-ha, then we are to tell the person that really shouldn't be eating cake to not eat cake. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this doesn't feel, like, very helpful. Sounds very stressful. I feel like we've just wasted about five to seven minutes. <laughs> no. Why did you keep that? No. Yes. <laughs> that all has to go. All that. No. No. Um, well, so, so this um, is saboteur. Yeah. Self so in a group what setting. Else? In a group setting. What else did you want to say? Then there's the... The what is it about this person place thing that I cannot maintain myself? Right? Is it a situation? Is it with a certain person? So, for example, I think of myself as quite easygoing, relaxed human being 99.8% of the time. That 0.2% is probably when I'm with my dad. <laughs> Triggers oh, the dad. shit out of me. Yep. So he's my biggest teacher in that regard. Mm-hmm. So then I have to sit down and, okay, what is it about him? And it probably goes back to the thing you were saying at the start about being heard, being seen, etc. where he's quite dismissive. Mm. So COVID was a great time for us. <laughs> so much learning <laughs> so to much be done. Cake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's an example of how that plays out. You've got to be consciously aware of it and it, when it rises up, you've got to be able to spot it. Okay, so let's say how to help yourself in terms of understanding where you're sabotaging yourself would be for a start, we sort of need to start to understand what what it is that we're sabotaging. Mm. And I would say that it's going to be things that happen over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be the things that you go, oh, yeah, that it just always happens to me. You know, always right? happens to me. Why always does this happens always happen? The minute you say this Why always me? happens yeah. to me, oh, this always happens to me, yeah. write that down mm-hmm. and then dissect it and understand what is the thing, what is the, under, yeah. what is the underlying theme of that What's your thing that keeps happening to, to that, that thing. The relationship to that thing. Yeah. Give could, me an example of that. It could be a food, it could be a person, it could be a situation. It's like these people, for example, that, you know those people that start something but they can never finish it? Oh, yeah, that's like. So the, their life looks like a constant, you know, watching TV, flick, 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 flick. Mm. That's what their life looks like. They go from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship and it never really goes anywhere because mm. it's they start something but they can't finish it. Mm-hmm. They don't know how to. Mm. So then once they've gotten clear on that, so let's say that example, someone's starting something and can't finish it, starting something and can't mm-hmm. finish it. And okay, now I've got an understanding of that. So from my perspective, that's the bead. Mm-hmm. Now I'm holding that bead in my, my, in my hand. I understand that what my theme is here is that I can start things but I can't finish them. Mm. And I'm sabotaging myself. Every time I start something new, I whatever, then it's like the story that I'm sharing to myself that stops me from keeping going. Well, the story that you're telling yourself is that I can't finish because. Yes, but that'll be, that'll be the same. Yeah. So whilst you're, you know, started something, I can't finish it, the story that is coming up a bit around that, like the, I can't finish it, mm-hmm. like what is that I can't finish it, there's going to be a reason why. Mm. And that reason, even though it might be for, oh, okay, I couldn't finish that because the sun went down or I couldn't mm. finish that because, oh, I needed to do this, this and this. But it, there's going to be like... There'll be a common thread. There's going to be the thread or there's going to be the reason, the actual real reason yeah. why you couldn't do that. Is often lack of a dream. Oh. Having something that you desire enough to energise with enough life force to make it happen into physical reality. But if you take on ten of those things at once. It's never going to be enough. No. But if you do like one overarching thing, or even if it's one little small thing, just do that and finish. That give you the self um, self sense of accomplishment. Then you go on to the next one, next one, next one, next one. That builds momentum. And then you get you start forming the greater idea of the big mm. legacy, if you will. Well, it's just really big, Matt. Well, Nula, you can have your cake and eat it too. Keen for it. 
I won't okay, say any crummy so, jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, would you say then, um, I guess, for, so that that's the part, and I guess how do we become aware? So how do we become aware of that in the first place? So first of all, we could say, okay, you become aware of it because you're doing the same thing over and over again. You're like, oh, I'm here again. Oh, I'm here again. That's mm-hmm. the piece from my perspective. The other part from what I was going to say, and I think you might have something else here too, is to make sure you, once you've identified those pieces, you've got to lean into the discomfort. Mm. So in the moment of like... Going. The cake is here. Yeah. It may magically disappear. Mm-hmm. And I forget that I've eaten it. Mm-hmm. It's in that moment of seeing the cake there and knowing that I'm not going to have it, like, or I don't want to have it. It doesn't reach my goals. It doesn't help me on this line, this, this, this. Then in that moment, leaning into that discomfort of saying, I'm not going to eat cake. You could also say, Why is the cake there? <laughs> Did you make the cake? Did someone bring it to you? Okay. Okay. Because it's the environment that you're in as well. Your environment that you're in also has to be conducive to you healing that. Yeah, so why are you in that environment in the first place? Well, if you're trying to lose weight, but then your partner keeps bringing um, cakes and cookies and whatnot, whatever else home. So why are you, ma- why are you in a relationship with this dude? Boom, get rid of him. <laughs> Well, no, that's where you can have a conversation with your partner and say, can you help me support me on my goal of losing weight? Mm. It's win-win for you. Um, and them probably because they 100%. shouldn't be eating cake either. That would, yeah. <laughs> I feel like this cake thing's got cake out of control. cake sometimes foods and it's not for every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow, you know yes. what, there must be something really big about cake at the moment because it, there just must be something in the air. I reckon everyone's having cake. But you know it is, it's springtime, everyone's about getting shredded for summer mm. and then there's so many good cakes around and they're probably like, well, what do I want more? Do I want this short-term happiness that I'm going to get from consuming this soul food? My soul will feel good but then my body won't feel good. will feel like shit. Yeah. Likely. Likely. Mm. Or, yeah, or do I stick to my goal? Is the goal strong enough? Is it worth it? Hashtag subjective. <laughs> Is there anything else that you think from the top, off the top of your head, just to, something that someone could do to help themselves when they are in a sabotage loop of, you know, self-destructive behaviour undermining themselves or others? I think we just need to be clear on what our North Star is, what are we going for, what's the direction we want to head, what are the the roadblocks and also when we do embody the saboteur, when it does come up, not beating yourself up too much because it's all part of learning and you'll know it's gone too far when it causes pain then that pain brings a lesson. So if we're open to learning the lesson, then that cake won't even be a thing anymore. Mm. So it's it's like life gives us little clues along the way. And if we're open to learning, listening to them and learning, the environment around us is talking to us 24-7. Yeah. We just need to widen the gaze. And a lot of people will see, well, why is this happening to me? Is really potentially a FedEx from heaven. Yeah. Trying to be you or, or get you to learn the lesson yeah. that you're here to learn. Mm. Big stuff. Oh. I hope you enjoyed it, guys. I hope you like cake. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. You've been listening to The Wizard and the Priestess. Thanks for stopping by. Stay connected and be open.